Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you could be here this evening. I'm Elizabeth Benyon, and I'm a professor of political science at Indiana University, South Bend, where I also serve as director of the American Democracy Project. And as part of the project, what we try to do is to give students and community members the knowledge, skills, and experiences they need to become active participants in their communities and also to actively participate in politics. And so uh, in that capacity, but also in my work as Director of Voter Services, for the League of Women Voters and president of the Indiana Debate Commission. I host a lot of political forums and candidate debates. And one thing you will notice during candidate debates is that they are often filled with logical fallacies. Logical fallacies are mistakes in reasoning that distract us, that mislead us, uh, that get us not to think logically, but to think with our emotions or to make the snap easy judgment that seems logical at the time, but really isn't. So it's important to know these fallacies ahead of time so that you can recognize them when you hear them. Uh, some of you may also know me from WNIT. I host a weekly show called Politically Speaking, and I interview a lot of politicians, but also authors, uh, academics, and, and activists. And so that's always fun and interesting to hear people share their ideas and to think about what evidence they're using to support their claims. And so that's what we're gonna talk about tonight are some of those common logical fallacies that we see in everyday life. All of us could be guilty of them, but we see them especially when we're flipping through social media or we're listening to a political speech. And what we wanna do is recognize these so we're not fooled uh, so that we can actually take a step back and say, wait a minute, is this a logical, cogent argument or am I being somehow misled because I am falling into the trap of incorrect or fallacious reasoning? And so what we're gonna do is learn about a few of these common fallacies and you'll get a chance to actually try diagnosing them and spotting them yourself here this evening. So what I will do next is to share my screen. So you should see crash course on, lo on logical fallacies. And the first thing I wanna start with just is this question of what is an argument? When we talk about arguments in everyday life, we often mean that we are upset with somebody and so we are arguing, right? It's considered almost a bad thing, something to try to avoid. You have blogs and articles about how to argue in a productive or healthy way with your spouse, right? And some evidence that uh, people who live together who argue but then work through it actually can maintain the relationship very well. But that's not what we mean here, getting mad or upset or yelling uh, or, or you know, just losing your, uh, your logic and your common sense and, and defaulting to emotion and to anger. What we really mean when we talk about arguments is making a claim, trying to convince somebody of something, and then supporting that claim with evidence. And so an argument shouldn't just be a claim about the way the world works, but it should be backed up with evidence. And so what we can do as critical thinkers is to think about whether or not this is a good or cogent uh, argument that is supported by facts, by evidence. So an argument is a claim supported by evidence or in other words, for, by reasons for accepting the claim. An argument includes at least one premise or reason and one conclusion or claim. A premise then is a statement and an argument that provides a reason to support the conclusion. And then the conclusion is the claim that you're making, that what you want your reader, your listener, your viewer to actually believe. So cogent reasoning is the term used for good reasoning. Uh, and so cogent arguments have three characteristics. The premises should be true. And we can start by asking, is this believable, right? On the surface, at face level, is it believable? And then we can do some research and actually find out, are all these reasons you're giving me for accepting your claim actually valid? Are they actually, are, or are they actually true? So then we can say, does this argument take into account all relevant information? Is the speaker suppressing 
evidence and information that would undermine or undercut their argument? Um, are they taking into account everything I need to know to really accept the conclusion? And then finally, is it logically valid? Um, do the premises actually provide a reason why the claim should be accepted? So for example, I could have all true uh, claims or uh, I could have all true rather reasons, premises leading to my conclusion, um, but they might not all be relevant. So I could say something like, I'm an excellent teacher. I trained for many years as a teaching assistant. I attend professional development workshops and teaching and learning conferences annually. I take student feedback seriously and adapt my courses every year. And I love mint chocolate chip ice cream and eat it at least once a week. I am a really great teacher, right? So all of those things could be true, but one of them has no relationship whatsoever to the claim, right? The others are probably uh, relevant. They might not be sufficient, right, to prove that I'm actually a good, let alone a great teacher, but there's some relevant information. The part about the ice cream, however, is completely irrelevant, even if it's true. So we want things that actually support the conclusion, as well as that are true themselves. And so when we investigate the argument, we want to look both, uh, we want to look at each of those reasons a person gives and say, wait, are these reasons accurate? Are they, are, they, are they true? So first thing we wanna do is just uh, try to see if we can distinguish conclusions from uh, premises. So Senator Romney will probably be named committee chair since he's been here the longest. Um, can anybody unmute and tell me what the conclusion or claim is? Or if you'd rather type it in the chat and Sarah will read it. <laughs> what do you think is, what's the conclusion here? And one way you can try I'll to- make a guess. Yeah, oh, go ahead. I'll make, is the conclusion that he's the appropriate person to be the committee chair? Well, that he will probably be named committee chair. Yeah, so we, and one way we can spot the premise from and tell it from, apart from the conclusion is to use words like since or because. So because he's been here the longest, therefore he'll probably be named committee chair. So yes, the conclusion or claim is Senator Romney will probably be named committee chair. The premise or the reason is he's been here the longest, but it may be that there are other factors, not just longevity that determine who has majority control in the Senate certainly will determine the committee chair. Other factors might as well, in ter in ter including how that person, how uh, well liked that person is by party leadership. So it's flu season and you work with kids, so you should get the flu shot. What's the conclusion? What do you think? Anybody take a guess? What kind of everyday arguments you would hear? What are we trying to convince the person to do? What's the claim? You should get the flu shot. You should get the flu shot. Perfect, exactly. You should get the flu shot. That's the claim, that's the conclusion. There are two premises or reasons given to support that claim. It's flu season, premise one, you work with kids, premise two, or reason two for accepting that claim. Now, there may be a whole host of other reasons why you should or shouldn't, and you wanna hear about those too, but this formulation of the argument gives you two premise, one premises, one conclusion. Almost 90% of all Americans, including more than 80% of gun owners, support universal background checks for firearms. Therefore, we should pass universal background checks. What's the conclusion? Okay, I'm getting good at it. We should do universal background checks. Yeah, we should pass universal background checks. So often in politics, the conclusion is the policy recommendation. You should do this and here are a couple of reasons why. Now there may be a whole host of other reasons why we should and why we shouldn't pass those background checks. But here we can see the argument that this person is trying to make is that we should pay attention to public opinion 
because public opinion supports this, therefore we should pass universal background checks. And that opinion is shared by the majority, a strong majority of both gun owners and non-gun owners. Okay, so you can see how these arguments are building. When an argument does not meet the criteria for cogent reasoning, the argument is often said to be fallacious. Lo logical fallacies or mistakes, uh, these fallacious arguments, logical fallacies are common in everyday arguments and of course in political arguments. Uh, so some examples of logical fallacies would include things like appeal to authority, where somebody says, President Biden believes that uh, DACA students should all have a path to um, legalization. Therefore, they should have a path or path to citizenship. Therefore, they should have a path to citizenship. There may be a whole host of reasons why they should or why they shouldn't have this path. But here, what's happening is an appeal to authority because Biden thinks that you should think it too. Uh, you should see him as a credible and trustworthy source. Of course, that might not work out so well if you thought that uh, Donald Trump should have won the election, but you appeal to some authority. Dr. Fauci says that people who are all vaccinated can now gather without face masks and uh, without social distancing. That is, we might also want to say, well, what evidence is Dr. Fauci using to make those claims? Do we know enough about the protection of the vaccine at this point to trust that? Most people don't go that far because they just appeal to the authority. Fauci is an expert, I'll believe what he says. Well, what if what he says is wrong? Early on, we didn't think masks would be very protective or beneficial. Later, as new scientific data came um, to light, right? Dr. Fauci changed his mind. You'll remember one of the things that President Trump did was to stress that Fauci got it wrong. Now, I think Dr. Fauci would say, this is how the scientific process works, right? You, you take a falsifiable hypothesis or claim about the way the world works, and then you keep getting more and more data. And then if it's no longer sustained, right, all your evidence doesn't support your conclusion, you come up with a new conclusion. Um, but here, by just referring to Dr. Fauci, President Biden, uh, your high school uh, coach, right? What they say must go, your parent, right? Uh, mom's always right. Um, it's appeal to authority. So another one is appeal to emotion. And one that's most uh, common in politics is appeal to fear. If you do not buy this latest handgun that Women in Guns magazine is selling, you will become a victim. And now let's put statistics and let's put horrific stories of people who were victimized to get you to make the purchase and uh, join perhaps the NRA or other groups that will push for uh, gun owner rights. And so there's this appeal to fear. We see this on uh, both sides of the aisle. Um, there's a reason why any restriction uh, or waiting period of any kind regarding abortion, why the symbol becomes the coat hanger, because it harkens back to this idea of women bleeding due to self-induced uh, 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 coat hanger, back alley abortions, and conjures up fear, right? Um, certainly, this idea of uh, the whole debate surrounding guns often has to do with this feeling of fear on both sides. The latest um, articles on psychology show this, where both people who support stricter gun control and those who uh, oppose many of those proposals are both doing so in part due to fear. And so it's easy to appeal to that emotion uh, rather than giving you logical evidence, facts, et cetera. So perhaps, uh, for example, you actually have seen the statistic that says you're more likely to be killed by a firearm if you have one in your home than if you don't. But your fear of becoming a victim and not being able to control your situation still makes that argument more persuasive than the statistics that you see. And so there are 
there are these appeals to emotions uh, that we see constantly in political reasoning. And it's not to say our emotions don't matter, um, uh, right? Uh, how we feel about the world and whether or not we feel confident um, in our workplaces and our homes, et cetera, matters. But it's important to recognize what's happening. Um, and then to say like, does this jive with, you know, will I be safe? Appeal to popularity. The bandwagon, everybody, 90% of Americans believe this. Everybody thinks this. Oh, well, if they all think it, I need must too. Uh, irrelevant reason, when people just engage in what's called a non sequitur and all of a sudden throw out something else, sometimes it's used as what they call a red herring to distract you from the real issue because they don't want to talk about it. And so they just start throwing out irrelevant reasons that they think will appeal to you and distract you, but aren't really supporting the argument. A questionable analogy, uh, which is a faulty comparison. You're comparing, comparing things that aren't right. So when a 17-year-old girl who's knocking back multiple um, shots of hard liquor every evening um, and is caught by her parents says, well, you know, Mr. Johnson next door, who's a 45-year-old man, right? His doctor told him that he needed to drink a glass of red wine every day for his heart health. What I'm doing is totally healthy and I'm just looking out for myself. Right? But that's totally a questionable analogy, a faulty comparison. It's apples and oranges. They're not the same age. They're not, they're, they're, it's not the same kind of alcohol. It, it doesn't have the same kind of properties. Right, But we see this a lot with uh, when people talk about military interventions. Oh, we shouldn't do this. This is just like Vietnam. Or, oh, we have to do this. This is just like World War II. Right? Uh, are they the same? Are they not the same? Uh, there's are they the same in things that matter that are relevant does it really support your argument so we always want to question those things um questionable cause is another one that you'll hear a lot with questionable cause sometimes people will assert that just because one thing happens before another thing it caused it we see this a lot with uh let's say a superstition so a black cat if i'm already <laughs> superstitious, a black cat crosses my path and I actually do fall on the sidewalk. Now that cat caused my fall, right? Well, maybe because I, if I'm so superstitious that I get scared and it makes me lose my balance, I suppose it could have, right? But just because something happens before something else doesn't mean that it caused something else. Similarly, let's say um, each time that you have your political science course it rains. So clearly taking political science classes causes it to rain, right? Well, it was probably a coincidence, right? One did not call, cause the other. And then finally, suppressed evidence. We see this all the time where folks will suppress especially good evidence on the other side of the debate in order to make their own argument seem stronger. This is one of the fallacies that you'll be asked to diagnose today, which is called the straw man, where I give my best evidence, but then I suppress the evidence of my opponent so that their argument seems ridiculous and unbelievable. And then, hey, guess what? You're on my side. You see this a lot with um, news programs, um, particularly the more opinion programs. We will bring in weak opponents, ignoring stronger ones, or the hosts which are who are commentators will really mischaracterize the other side of the debate in order to make the viewers feel that there's only one logical side to be on. Okay. Any questions there before we move on to some other examples that I'll define? Um, I'll give you an example and then we'll have a poll to see if you can spot them yourself. And it will be anonymous, so everybody should guess because we won't know whether you got it right or wrong. We'll just be able to see how everybody did. So it'll be fun. Uh, any questions before we move on? So I want to explain five common logical fallacies other than the ones I've just identified. Number one is called begging the question. You'll sometimes hear this called circular reasoning. This is assuming as a premise some form of the very point at issue. In other words, the conclusion you intend to prove. And so here's an example from the world of baseball. Joe Morgan announcing a Giants-Marlins baseball game and commenting on the Marlin pitcher. 
he's been a little erratic, which explains why he hasn't been consistent. So sometimes this looks like synonyms, right? You're basically stating your premise as a reason and then stating it again as a conclusion. You assume the truth of your conclusion in your premise set. You're just basically restating yourself and pretending that you're making a point. If I say something like, I know that God exists because I read it in the Bible, and I read it in the Bible, um, and the Bible is the word of God. Um, so the problem is, all of it is you're assuming the same thing. That doesn't mean God does exist or God doesn't exist. It just means that this way of trying to prove the existence of God is not very persuasive because all you're doing is assuming that because it says something in a book, it must be true. But the reason you believe everything in the book is because it's written by God. But if there was no God, the book wouldn't be true and it wouldn't be proof, right? So, so you are just engaged in circular reasoning. Evading the issue. This is when you avoid the issue entirely, right? Someone doesn't want to talk about something. Maybe they're embarrassed about it. Maybe they know that their position is unpopular. Um, maybe they've done something wrong and they don't want to draw attention to it. Um, and so for whatever reason, they avoid the issue entirely. In an interview with Sarah, Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, Larry King asked whether she was friends with Prince Charles. She replied, well, Larry, the important thing is that I have great respect for the royal family. What you can see there is she never answers the question about her relationship with Prince Charles. And of course, the royals are very much in the media once again after Oprah's interview with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And uh, a lot of issues they, that other people wish they would have evaded, I think, in, the, in that interview. <laughs> but they chose to tackle them head on. OK, false dilemma. This is sometimes called the either or fallacy or the black and white fallacy or the false choice fallacy. The false dilemma is asserting that a complex situation um, presents only two alternatives when in fact there are other options. This is often a problem that we hear in politics. Somebody wants you to accept their version of events um, and their policy solution, and the other option is horrible and terrible, so it's the only way to go. But really, there are usually many other options if we're creative. So an example could also come from the world of academia, an academic dean to the faculty of his college. The budget situation is dire. We can either increase class sizes by 30% or start cutting faculty lines. Think about which is worse, bigger classes or faculty layoffs. So the problem here is there could be other options, right? There could be other things that could be cut Faculty often suggest administrator salaries, um, but there are a variety of things. I mean, do you cut back on landscaping, perhaps? You water less often. You know, there might be a variety of things that you could do to cut costs besides um, increasing class sizes by 30%. Maybe you increase them by 10% and then do a variety of other things. Okay. Inconsistency. This is accepting the conclusion of an argument that contains statements that contradict each other. So this is a notice from the Hyatt Regency Hotel in New Orleans. We are pleased to confirm your reservation. It will be held on a space available basis. <laughs> so why is that inconsistent? Can somebody tell me? Because either they will hold it for you or they won't. But it sounds like they're saying both. <laughs> right. A reservation, as we understand it, is they're holding it and reserving it for you. <laughs> but then they're saying a space available basis. The other way we hear this in politics is politicians telling different groups different things, catering to what they think they want to hear. And so, you know, fossil fuels are great. I support clean coal when you're talking uh, in coal country, right? And then renewables are fantastic. My top priority is moving toward renewables when you're facing a group that is pushing for um, better um, options in terms of solar and wind power. And so you might 
it might be that this person has one of these all of the above energy policies, but what they're saying might actually seem to suggest that coal is number one and that we have to um, place uh, energy um, independence first through fossil fuels at one to one audience and that the only way our country will survive and thrive in the future um, and protect the planet is through renewables to another audience and they're being inconsistent. Um, the one thing we have to avoid with this fallacy is a false charge of fallacy. Sometimes people do change their minds. So somebody may change their position on an issue. An obvious example for many politicians is the issue of same-sex marriage. So people like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama were opposed to same-sex marriage and later changed their mind. If they talk about the issue now, um, after years of being consistent in their support, we want to every single time they talk, pull out an article from 10 years ago and say, you're being inconsistent, right? So people do change their mind on issues and then they're consistent with their new uh, opinion. But when we hear people just saying one thing to one audience, another thing to another audience, or even using inconsistent statements in the same speech, which we actually hear a frightening <laughs> amount, um, that's where we want to catch up. I probably, I, what I want to do is count because I feel like I'm doing a lot. So begging the question, one, evading the issue, two, false dilemma, three, inconsistency, four, and straw man, five. Okay, make sure we're on track here before our first poll. So the fifth one that I want to talk to you about is the straw man. Uh, this is an argument that's really weak. So weak, you could just blow it away like a piece of straw. Um, misrepresenting an uh, opponent's position or a competitor's product to make your own seem better or attacking a weaker opponent rather than stronger ones. What you're doing is suppressing the best evidence on the other side in order to make your position look stronger or you're grossly mischaracterizing your opponent's position so that your own position will seem stronger. So here's an example. Um, <laughs> Eric Jubler in an article in which he argued America should open up its wilderness areas. In other words, open it to logging and drilling. The purist, which is his term for the conservationist, is generally speaking against everything. The purist believes that those who do not agree with him desire to rape the land. right? And so by using this word, this purist who goes around accusing everybody of rape, right? It makes it seem really extreme. So I'm the reasonable one who cares about jobs and, and believes that we have to open up these areas for the good of the whole. And here's this person who's just against everything and goes around t saying that everybody is a rapist, right? Is raping the land. Uh, and so you're mischaracterizing like, oh, do I want to be associated with that person, right? So you're really making your opponent's position seem perhaps more radical, less desirable to be associated with than they really are. Okay. So what okay. we're going to do is we're going to start with a poll. And what it will do is test you on these five fallacies. So just do your best at answering. The question number one was Pat Robertson discussed described a feminism as a socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, craft, destroy capitalism and become lesbians. This is a quote when the state of Iowa was, de was debating an equal rights amendment. Um, and it is straw man. It is straw man because he is mischaracterizing his uh, opponent's argument or position, right? So he's saying that what feminism is, is this socialist uh, movement that encourages them to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism and become lesbians, right? And so he makes it seem extremely radical. He's going to paint it in the worst possible light to try to get uh, people not to uh, support the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which says that equality of the law shall not be denied or abridged um, on account of sex, um, by really sort of saying, no, it, this isn't about gender equality, it's about all these other things, right? So he's gonna suppress any arguments that somebody might agree with feminism is about um, equality for men and women under the law, and instead give this as what um, the feminist agenda looks like. Okay, so that would be a straw man. 
Number two was that college student explaining to his girlfriend why he was not home last night. Don't worry, the important thing is I love you. <laughs> I'm planning a special anniversary dinner at your favorite restaurant, including a surprise gift I know you really like. And 90% uh, of you recognize that as evading the issue, right? He's not answering the actual question, but instead talking about something totally different. We assume that he's probably gonna be um, and, and making those reservations and picking up that gift after uh, talking to his girlfriend. Uh, he just does not want to answer the question. Number three, I'm a strong supporter of free speech. Free speech is the cornerstone of a free society, but the speaker proposed by the college Democrats is offensive. There's no room for such ideas on a college campus. And whether we put Democrats or Greens uh, or any other party in there, the issue would be the same. And it is, only two of you chose this, but it's inconsistency. Because the speaker is saying, I'm a strong supporter of free speech. Free speech is the cornerstone of a free society. But, you know, this speaker is offensive, so there's no room for that speaker here. Um, I don't actually uh, support free speech if it's offensive to me. Okay, so that's inconsistent argument. Number four was the high school senior to his mom. It may be a lot of money now, but it will pay off later. As I see it, you have two choices here. You can either pay for me to attend college next fall, or I can keep living at home and working at the drugstore until I die, right? That is the false dilemma, the either or fallacy, which is you have two choices, right? In reality, of course, there are other choices. Maybe you work some to gather money and then go to college. Maybe you work part-time and go to school part-time. Maybe you apply for um, grants or loans. Um, maybe you go to a less expensive college. Maybe you room with six buddies in a big house, you know, rather than in your mom's basement to cut uh, rent. You know, there are lots of different options that a person and get some scholarships um, may have, not just those two. Okay, and then number five, uh, a father discouraging his daughter from smoking marijuana. Smoking pot is wrong because it's Ill illegal, and it is illegal because it is wrong. And 70% of you recognize that as circular reasoning or begging the question. You're assuming the truth of your conclusion and your premises. So all you're doing basically is engaging in a circular logic. It's wrong because it's illegal. It's illegal because it's wrong. Uh, wait a minute. You're not actually saying anything new. You're not giving any reasons. You're just assuming that if something is um, illegal, it's wrong. And so you're basically saying it's illegal because it's wrong. And therefore, it's wrong because it's illegal, right? Uh, so it's circular reasoning. Another question about straw man came up was um, if that's related to the election and how one person twists the other's words, like one candidate twists the other's words, is that considered a straw man? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so, so that is absolutely what we see in uh, debates we'll often see, and as well as candidate interviews, as well as campaign flyers uh, and ads, we see a twisting of what the opponent believes and a misrepresentation of what the opponent believes. And it may have some kernel or grain of truth, but it's twisted to almost a farcical, uh, often very negative, uh, interpretation of that person's um, belief system. And so that's what we see in political debates all the time and in political advertising. Folks will take latch onto one thing they know is unpopular and then really um, stress that aspect of it. So the fact that um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are pro-choice, for example, will be twisted to argue that their entire position on the issue is, you know, the, uh, that they are baby killers who wish to rip um, babies out of their mother's rooms. Um, this is a 
classic type of straw man uh, argument where you're not giving the position, the arguments, their reasoning, but instead trying to make the argument seem the most extreme possible um, to sway people to your side instead. Okay. Or like the whole debate over defunding police where uh, it became that folks wanted to truly take every single penny away from police. There'd be no more police, there'd be no more law enforcement, um, rather than, it's, it's a, in some ways it was a terrible slogan because it, it, um, it, it really lent itself to that type of characterization, but rather than saying, okay, we need to budget for mental health care, for prevention services, for social workers, et cetera, so that police aren't doing the work that all these folks do in addition um, to their law enforcement. So the actual positions are often much more complex and nuanced than the straw man argument would lead one to believe, okay. All right, so set two common fallacies, definitions and examples. This is the ad hominem attack. This is a very common one <laughs> in politics and political debates and political ads as well. This is attacking the opponent rather than the opponent's argument. And of course, you know, Donald Trump perhaps is the most famous recent politician in terms of the names that he has for everybody, Crooked Hillary, um, uh, just every single uh, politician he would have uh, an attack for, right? Carly Fiorina during the first primary debate and talking about her horse face and things like that has nothing to do with her argument. Um, and so these are attacking the person. Right, but he is by far, you know, far from alone in making these attacks. And why might somebody do this? Well, uh, you maybe don't feel that you have the strongest arguments. Maybe the evidence and the facts aren't on your side. So you instead just attack the person. They're not credible, they're not believable. Uh, so just don't listen to anything they say, listen to me instead. I might not have any good information for you, but they're so terrible that um, you should still believe me. So you're attacking the opponent rather than the argument. Uh, Senator Jennings Randolph during the debate on the Equal Rights Amendment dismissed arguments by feminists who testified before Congress by referring to these women as a small brand of braless bubbleheads. Now, I use that example uh, intentionally because we had the straw man with Pat Robertson talking about feminism as a movement that encourages women to leave their um, husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, uh, destroy capitalism and become lesbians that that was about the feminist agenda. What do feminists believe? What do they support? That's why it's straw man, a sort of mischaracterization of or radicalization of the, um, of the argument. In this case, it's not an attack on the platform or the positions, but it's just on the people themselves, right? A small band of brawless bubbleheads, you don't have to worry about them, think about them, consider their ideas because they're um, not very smart. Um, they just stand around burning bras all day, right? <laughs> or refusing to wear them. Um, and so the attack is on the person. Uh, this would be the same when you try to impugn a witner, witness's credibility or character. Um, sometimes it is appropriate though. If you have uh, a, an expert witness and this doctor is testifying about a um, heart valve surgery and possible problems with the valve itself and the material used in the valve in a malpractice lawsuit. And it turns out that the doctor is a PhD in English literature, right? You would be right to question the person's credentials um, and what expertise they have. Or if a witness on the stand, uh, it turns out that they have perjured themselves twice before, uh, right? We'd want to know that it would be relevant. But generally, when this is a fallacy, right, you're just ignoring the argument and attacking the person just to try to um, uh, make sure that they're not seen as credible, discredit them so people will believe whatever you have to say because you're the better choice. 
second one is common practice. This is the everybody's doing it justification. But what we need to remember is just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. Um, the behavior or the policy choice, right? Just because lots of uh, governments or countries are doing something doesn't necessarily mean it's the best choice. Uh, just because lots of people are misbehaving doesn't mean we're right in misbehaving ourselves. So justifying a wrong on the grounds that most or lots of others do the same thing. So here is an example from a letter to the editor in the San Francisco Chronicle. What again, another jab at the CIA by Jack Anderson. All countries have spy organizations. Most of them sometimes overstep the bounds of propriety. Why single out our own outfit? In other words, I'm not gonna defend what the CIA did, whether that's black sites torture that they said was illegal, but we're doing uh, anyway, right? Instead, I'm just gonna say, look, others do it too. So there's nothing wrong. You, you can't make an argument against what they're doing because other agencies do it too, right? Everybody's doing it. The problem is that's a fallacy. That's not actually providing evidence to justify that what they did was appropriate, right, or necessary. Okay, so common practice, everybody's doing it. The slippery slope. This one is very, very common in everyday reasoning and also certainly in political uh, arguments. So definition, objecting to a course of action on the grounds that once it is taken another and then perhaps and still others is bound to be taken leading to negative consequences. Perhaps the interest group that most effectively, powerfully, um, and, uh, and um, persuasively um, has perfected this argument is the NRA, right? It, the NRA used to very much support certain kinds of restrictions on what they saw as bad actors, right? To protect the rights of responsible gun owners, um, they were willing to have background checks, for example, or to suggest, you know, okay, well, we do want to keep hand, the guns out of the hands of some other folks. But increasingly, the NRA has come to um, take the position that any congressional regulation of firearms or state regulation for that matter is just a slippery slope. Once the government takes one step, whether that is banning um, your Kevlar piercing cop killer bullets, right? Or um, even bump stocks, right? Banning bump stocks to convert a semi-automatic to an automatic weapon. Um, that anything, anything that happens that's a regulation, right? Is just part of that slippery slope that next the government will come for your handguns and your hunting rifles, right? And it's all downhill from there. You can't let them take an it. If you give them an inch, you'll take a mile, right? Um, so this argument of the slippery slope, they're by far the only ones, right? But they're probably the most um, well-known example of a group that uses this argument. So it is, um, here's an example um, on marijuana, right? It would be foolish to permit the sale of marijuana to seriously ill people with a medical prescription that just opens the floodgates to the complete legalization of that dangerous drug. Now, interesting thing about slippery slope arguments, it won't be the case that what they predict never happens, right? Or that what they predict always happens. Right, we're not really, it's not really about the conclusion. It's about the form of the argument. We just don't know, right? Just because a state legalizes marijuana for medicinal purposes, it's true that they might then take a later step and legalize it more broadly for recreational purposes, but not all states will do that, right? Some will keep it for medicinal purposes. And so there's just this idea that automatically all these things will follow when in fact they may not. Okay. You, you haven't provided evidence to prove this case. Okay, so traditional wisdom is the next one in this group of five. And traditional wisdom is we've always done it this way. Must be right because we've always done it this way. So justifying a practice on the grounds that is traditional or an historically accepted way of doing things. 
Um, female genital mutilation, for example, is often a practice supported by traditional wisdom. It's always been done this way. My mother and my grandmother had it done. We, um, they su support it because it's the way that we um, have always done things. And so it is a, um, Western imperialism to tell me otherwise, right? Um, now, there are lots of complicated things in that larger debate, but the biggest thing is um, in traditional wisdom um, that we've just always done that, that way. So we'll, we can keep doing it this way. It's justified. We shouldn't even debate it, right? Um, Definition then, justifying a practice on the grounds it is traditional or historically accepted way of doing things. Here's an example um, of Jules Crittenden, an embedded journalist. That's where they are embedded with tr uh, troops uh, during wartime. Uh, and he defended himself from criticisms for bringing home illegal souvenirs from Iraq saying, I understand and share the world's concern about the disappearance of legitimate Iraqi national treasures that are in fact treasures of human civilization. Crittenden wrote in an open letter. However, those are matters separate from the time-honored tradition among soldiers of bringing home reminders of some of the most intense experiences of their lives. There was no exception to that historical practice in this war um, until the reporters and soldiers, of course, were subject to search by federal agents um, when it really became clear that uh, folks worldwide were concerned about the um, pillaging of national treasures from Iraq. So this became a, a big debate. I actually ended up having, you know, a very tense moment in, in class where a couple of students who had both been in Iraq, one guarding palaces uh, of Saddam Hussein and one um, doing door-to-door -door sweeps, had very different experiences with one, um, his troop actually bringing home souvenirs, and then he actually brought some to class. And then the other Marine who had done the door-to-door -door sweeps, like his unit was very clear, you take nothing. And he was visibly upset. Um, and so it, it, this was a um, a real issue, and it is true that there had been sort of this tradition, but it's also true that as um, the issue became better known and more controversial, they started really cracking down. Um, here we see two problems, right? The First of all, the reporter seems to lump himself in with the soldiers just because he's embedded with them, right? But it's clearly a traditional wisdom, right? It's a time-honored tradition. You can't tell me it's wrong. Sure, maybe, maybe it's not the best, but it's a time-honored tradition. You take these souvenirs, right? We've always done it. You can't criticize me or any of the troops because we've always done it this way. It's a tradition. Okay, so that's different than common practice. Everybody's doing it. It's traditional wisdom. We've always done it this way and you justify it. Um, and we do all kinds of things in our own culture um, as well. And you'll see that in the, <laughs> in the poll. Um, two wrongs. This is a common one if you have kids, um, probably kids any age, but it starts probably about two. Justifying a wrong, pointing to a similar wrong done by others, often one's accuser. Um, so a husband at a divorce hearing justifying his affair with his secretary. Well, Your Honor, I'm not proud of what I did, but it should be noted for the record that my wife cheated on me first. She was the one who originally broke our marriage vows. Right, so I'm justifying my behavior because yeah, I was a cheater, but she cheated first, right? Well, that doesn't make what you did any better, right? You may feel that it justifies what you did, but probably not. Similarly with little kids, right? One pushes one, uh, uh, the sibling, then the sibling hits, then the other one bites or what, you know, but it's all justified because that one started it, right? Uh, or fights in school, which is why some schools have sort of the zero tolerance policy, which could be complicated in its own way, but the idea is we're not going to get into who started it, you should have walked away. So two wrongs. All right, so for a quick, uh, oh, okay, here we go. So ad hominem, tacking the person, common practice, everybody's doing it. Slippery slope, oh, if we do this, negative after negative after negative will follow traditional wisdom, we've always done it this way, or two wrongs, hey, that person did it first. 
Great. So the teacher arguing against students' petition to abolish school uniforms, all 10 of you said slippery slope, right? Abolish the uniform, then they start wearing mini skirts, tube tops, ripped jeans, and then drug abuse, teen pregnancy, and all of these undesirable outcomes will follow. Yeah, classic slippery slope. It's all downhill from here. If we allow this, there we go. Um, a fan of Martha Stewart defending her against accusations of insider trading. So what if she did act on confidential information from the CEO? People do that all the time. Why are you singling her out for prosecution? Some of you will remember Martha Stewart did go to jail for a year for insider training at, at trading. And at the time, many people made this argument. And it's true. There are a lot of other people who did it and didn't get singled out. But it didn't make what she did right. And 90% of you recognize that as common practice. Everybody's doing it. So don't pick on poor Martha. Number three, a political candidate about his opponent. You should not vote for somebody you cannot trust and you cannot trust my opponent. He's a juvenile delinquent. And it is believed he battered his first wife. Is he somebody who can keep you safe? So other than the fact that the juvenile record should be Seal, uh, sealed and the believe to have battered without evidence is also a problematic accusation, right? An allegation. The big thing here is to the man and not talking about what your opponent believes, what his positions are, just trying to dirty him up so nobody will want to vote for him. And 90% of you said that is a to the man ad hominem uh, attack. And number four, was a four-year-old explaining why he hit his two-year-old sister? Well, mom, Anna Marie shoved me. She came over and shoved me and started laughing. I told her to stop, but she did it again. She touched me first. Exactly right. Tradition, it is the two wrongs. She did it first, so I'm justified in hitting her back. And then the father explaining to his reluctant spouse why their baby should be circumcised. I use this because, um, you know, smaller villages um, abroad that practice female genital mutilation are not the only ones who engage in kind of ritualistic practices that modern medicine tells us aren't strictly necessary for um, uh, uh, medical um, reasons. And so circumcision um, is quite common in this country, right? My brother, my father, my grandfathers and I were all circumcised. So are the boys in your family. Why is this subject to debate? Our families have always circumcised our son. And this is probably the most common argument along with common practice where people say, yeah, everybody's doing it. I don't want my kid to feel uncomfortable in the locker room. That's less true than it used to be in the US where it's more um, mixed and not as common as it used to be, but definitely this idea of like, oh, this has always been part. And then for some, it is also tied to religious rituals, which makes the argument much stronger and of a different na nature. But um, a lot of things we do is just because we've always done it that way without reevaluating over time. Okay. There might be other reasons, right? But that's, those aren't the ones here. So we did ad hominem, common practice, slippery slope, traditional wisdom, two wrongs. Our final set of five. Um, <laughs> the first is appeal to ignorance. Uh, the definition, believing that something is true because there is no good evidence that it is false. Or the, it takes the form of believing that it's false because there's no conclusive evidence that it's true. What you're doing here is you're appealing to ignorance, meaning you're appealing to a lack of information. There's no evidence to prove that it's not true, so I'm just gonna believe it, right? And so here is uh, an evidence that we're perfectly entitled to believe that there's a God. After all, every effort by atheists to prove otherwise has failed. Well, you are perfectly entitled to believe uh, that there is a God. But the existence of God is a very difficult one to prove through evidence. That's why we don't tend to use a scientific method and why we call it a leap of faith or a matter of faith, right? You're taking it on faith, meaning I don't necessarily need the evidence. But to simply say like, you didn't prove that this doesn't exist, so therefore it's po proof positive it does exist, that's a problem. Similarly, we can say um, in terms of <laughs> In, in terms of uh, Dan Brown and his various, um, uh, so what am I thinking here? Sarah, help me out. Um, the, um, oh gosh, all these conspiracies about, oh, the Illuminati. 
um, like angels and demons. Um, <laughs> uh, so you say like, oh, there's no evidence to prove that the Illuminati exists. That must be because they so th thoroughly and craftily destroyed it all. Right. So the fact that there's no evidence to approve to prove the existence of this secret cult like group means that they exist. Right. Are you taking the lack of evidence as positive proof that they do exist? What's the first book? <laughs> oh, uh, angels and uh, no, I can't think of either. Um, it, it, uh, the Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code, yes. More people are familiar with that one than Angels and Demons. So, <laughs> okay, the Da Vinci Code, yeah. So you have these shadowy secret groups, right, controlling things behind the scenes. Um, but like all of those conspiracies make sense when they put it together in the script, right? <laughs> uh, or in the book, um, it, it appears to. <laughs> okay, associational fallacy. Um, perhaps one of the most famous is guilt by association. You could also have pride by association, or uh, but we'll focus on guilt by association uh, tonight. So this is where you assert that the qualities of one thing are inherently qualities of another, merely by association. So example here, John. John is a con artist, John is a Republican, therefore all Republicans are con artists. You could say John has black hair, um, therefore all people with black hair are con artists. Uh, John is a Baptist, uh, right, therefore all uh, Baptists are con artists. Uh, insert your identity or your association here, but the idea is that, oh, you're just like all of the others. This takes a lot of different forms, this guilt by association, so it could be you worked at a firm that did something that was later discredited. You work at a PR firm that put out a fake story that got a lot of negative publicity. Therefore, somebody says, well, we know we can't trust her because she worked at that firm. Uh, well, that doesn't mean that you are not trustworthy or that you had anything to do with that story, right? But you're guilty by association. Or even we see that you're hanging out downtown near where prostitutes hang out and we assume that you are a pimp or a John, but in fact, you are a minister or a sociologist or somebody else, right? That So just guilt by association. There's rarely a high degree of probability and um, uh, accuracy in your assumptions, right? You're just jumping um, to uh, this, conclusion based on an association with a person or a place or a um, uh, identity of some sort. So equivocation is the next one. This is when we uh, use a term in an ambiguous way. We can mislead people by having more than one meaning. So sometimes this is not a fallacy. Um, in this example, from Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Car Carroll, the author isn't committing a fallacy. Lewis Carroll wants us to see the different meanings of this um, text because that's the only way that we can understand the humor in what's happening. But Alice is caught in fallacious reasoning because she can't come to the right conclusion because the language is misleading, it's ambiguous, she doesn't know how to take it. So you couldn't have it if you did want it, the queen said. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. It must sometimes come to jam today, Alice objected. No, it can't, said the queen, it's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. So could somebody, um, maybe somebody could unmute and be willing to tell me what does Alice think every other day means? And what does the queen think every other day or any other day means? Why are they not understanding each other? So let's say they're having tea on a Tuesday. When does Alice think it will be jam? On a Wednesday, right? The next day, the every other day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, not Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, in contrast, right, the queen says it isn't any other day, meaning any other day that's not today, right? And so every day you're going to have that same problem and it will never be jam. 
Uh, so that's equivocation. If you are the author of a manuscript, whether it's a short story or a poem or a novel, and you give it to a publisher, and the publisher says, well, I thank you, I will waste no time in reading it. You might not be fully satisfied, right? You hope when they say, I will waste no time in reading it, that they mean, I'll read it right away, I'll waste no time, I'll get to this right away. But they could mean that they will waste no time reading it. What this would mean then is they're not gonna take a second to read it, it's going straight in the recycling bin, okay? So there's equivocation here. We don't know what the word means, so we can't reason properly and reach the correct conclusion. The next is the hasty conclusion, also called hasty generalization. This is drawing a conclusion based on relevant but insufficient evidence. In other words, my father smoked four packs of cigarettes a day since age 14 and lived until age 76. Therefore, smoking can't really be that bad for you. Okay, I mean, you've given an example of somebody who smoked very heavily for many years and survived and lived to, you know, maybe many of us wanna live even longer than that, but it wouldn't be considered a super young or um, early death, so live fairly long. So that is relevant information. If you found lots and lots and lots of people who all lived healthfully to 76 or past who all smoked four packs a day, right? But a case study of one is not sufficient to draw the conclusion, okay? So if you have a really small sample um, and you just ask two friends and then you make a generalization about what Americans believe about a policy because of what your two friends said, right? It's not that what they say is irrelevant, but you do not have a big enough sample size. You do not have a representative sample. It's too hasty for you to draw that conclusion. Next is tokenism. In tokenism, we accept a token gesture in lieu of something more substantive. Here's an example from the New York Times from the late 80s when President Bush was asked how he could justify claiming he was a good candidate for Black Americans when he did nothing to influence the Reagan administration against watering down civil rights laws during his eight years as vice president to President Reagan. Bush replied, but I helped found the Yale chapter of the United Negro College Fund, right? So he gives us one example of something he did to promote African-American achievement and equality as a college student. One example, right? To suggest or to try to cause us to believe that he's a great champion for African-American progress, for racial equality, for civil rights, okay? So it's a token gesture in lieu of the real thing. Similarly, if a company like Nike is criticized for child labor and then they release a story about the two plants they're shutting down that um, use child labor. Well, what about the rest of the plants worldwide, right? A token gesture um, that doesn't really prove the larger point. Okay, so the first is that university president. I have always championed gender equality. Two of my strongest supporters are women who were promoted to the status of full professor during my presidency. Appeal to ignorance, lack of evidence as positive evidence, equivocation, ambiguous use of language, guilt by association, assuming that somebody's guilty because they're associated with something else that's negative, a hasty generalization, rust, rushing to a conclusion without, with maybe relevant but insufficient evidence, or tokenism, wanting us to accept a token in lieu of the real thing, something more substantial, more evidence. Here we go. Yes, number one, uh, tokenism was the choice of our <laughs> remaining participant here, a university president. Uh, oh, two women were promoted to full professor during my presidency. It doesn't mean that he did anything to help them. It doesn't mean that uh, there was any program to support gender equality. There's just like, you didn't uh, actually veto their promotions, that's a really small token of a larger claim to champion gender equality. Ghosts do not exist. Nobody ever has proven that ghosts exist. After years of trying, there's simply no proof. Therefore, we can definitively conclude there is no such thing as a ghost. 
That's accepting the absence of evidence as positive proof. Um, that would be appeal to ignorance. It is a, is a type of uh, uh, hasty generalization in some ways, but it really what it best exemplifies is that appeal to ignorance, that accepting a lack of evidence as positive proof that you are right. If somebody else hasn't proven that their ghost exists, that means that I'm right, they do not. Definitively, I can tell you that. Number three was a driver trying to get out of a parking ticket. The sign said fine for parking. It said it was fine, so I parked, he says to the judge, right? That is actually equivocation. The reason it's equivocation is the word fine. And you get the sense that this person knew very well that the fine went meant a monetary penalty for parking there, but they chose it was fine, it's okay, right? Uh, to try to get out of the ticket. The next one is Simon and Brett are friends of Josh and they both supported the January 6th siege of the US Capitol. Jill is a friend of Josh, therefore Jill must have supported the insurrection too. That is guilt by association, just because Jill is friend with Josh and so are two folks who supported the attack on the Capitol does not mean that Jill uh, does too. So just because you're associated with Josh <laughs> does not prove that at all. All right, and number five, I randomly selected five people and asked them their opinion on Medicare for all. Four out of five support it. It is clear that there is a strong majority support for universal single payer healthcare in the United States. And that is a hasty generalization based on a very small and unrepresentative sample. You've made a conclusion about what Americans as a whole think. You are going to want to have between 1,100 and 1,600 people in your poll, uh, and you're going to want to draw it randomly so each member of the population has an equal chance of being selected into your sample. If you're gonna generalize to the United States, you can't just ask five people who you happen to see or five close friends. And so that le leads to an unrepresentative sample and a small sample that produces a hasty generalization. These are some of the fallacies that uh, we teach about. I mentioned some others at the beginning of the presentation, and there are many more, and there are some different names that people use for them. But these logical fallacies are important to understand because they are so common, and we can be so easily misled because they seem sometimes to be common sense. It's just an easy way of thinking. Uh, they can be powerful. They often appeal to our emotions or to our desire to have a shortcut <laughs> to come to our conclusions, right? It's easier than saying, wait, what is your evidence? Now let me look at that evidence. Let me examine that evidence and see if there's a reason to, so, to um, actually believe that it's true. Is the source reputable? Does it comport with, is it um, jive with, is it similar to other types of evidence by other credible sources, right? Those are the kind of questions we really should be asking rather than just falling for these fallacious arguments, but it is easy to fall for them, but perhaps a little bit less likely if we are prepared and have this self-defense manual. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, appreciate those who were able to attend the session, main session for our first 10 fallacies, and those of you who are able to stick around for a few more.